those with us. I have a, a two-part message, and I'm calling it the resting uh, in the Spirit is the idea. I told uh, Rhonda this morning, I said, I think I got a pretty good message for the next couple of weeks, and she said, well, that's about time. Um, so that's uh, my life. Uh, but anyway, um, but here's, uh, here's what I want you to understand. I, I, I think rest is vitally important. That's kind of not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about resting in the spirit. Here's maybe a little overarching thought uh, for the message itself. Serving God may be physically exhausting. Might be. Sometimes on uh, Sunday nights, you get home and you're tired, right? So serving God may be physically exhausting, but should always be emotionally restful. And that's where your mind is as you serve the Lord. And so this is what I want us to think about. It's a mindset. It's who's, it, who's, who's responsible uh, I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 4 in just in a minute and read much of Hebrews 4 to us. I'm also going to quote a couple of uh, verses from the, uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers. But let me just give you a couple of things uh, here. Emotion, most of the time when somebody says that's an emotionally exhausting job, there's physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and super exhausted when you're physically and emotionally exhausted. Most of the time, emotional exhaustion comes from the responsibility that you feel and that you bear. That's, that's what drains you when you're responsible for something, right? I like it unto um, when I go to another church and I can just go in and, you know, sit where I want to sit, which is usually in the back somewhere, and just like take it in. Uh, I feel no responsibility to anyone, anything, or anybody, that's a whole different feel than when I'm at my church because I have responsibilities here. Those of you who serve, you got responsibilities here. And so it feels a little different. Here's the thing, though. Whether you have a responsibility within the church or don't have a responsibility within the church, the responsibility for life change is not on any, is not on any of us. I cannot do for you what the Holy Spirit can needs to do. The, tr the life transformation that I want to see take place in your life, just like I want to see take place in mine, I can't do that. And so there is a lack of, uh, when I'm, even in a church service where I have responsibilities, I don't carry all the responsibility because the work that needs to be done needs to be through the Holy Spirit. And so I am resting or relying on the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do in a church service. I cannot carry that. And I've felt like in the past years ago, I tried to carry that. Like I, you know, like that was like that was on me. And if the Lord wasn't working in your life or wasn't answering the prayers, I felt like, well, Lord, uh, you know, like it was always like, well, what more do I need to do? That is emotionally exhausting, and that's not where the Lord is, wants you to serve from. So the serving the Lord, resting in his spirit, uh, you may be physically exhausted as you serve the Lord. I like it until the uh, when, when Jesus was feeding the 5,000, right? Those, those disciples at the end of the day were physically exhausted, right? I mean, they were set people in 50s and 100s. And I mean, just can you imagine? I'm sure they had bread in their hair and in their beard. And, you know, they're just trying to feed a whole lot of people. But the responsibility of feeding those people was not upon them. That was upon the Lord. Jesus even tried to prompt it a little bit to like, hey, you go feed them. And they said, Lord, we have no way of, of, of purchasing this much bread. And, and the Lord was wanting them to understand, that's exactly right. I'll provide the bread. But granted, there's going to be a lot of work on your part, but the responsibility of life change, of the miracle taking place, of what God needs to do, that's not on you. That's on the Lord. And so when you understand that, and you walk in that, there is a rest. There's a resting within the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Because this is what God's doing. 
So when I ask you, like, hey, how's your relationship with the Lord? If your first response focuses on you, it might be an indication that you're carrying too much responsibility in this thing. It's like, what's the Lord doing in your life? The, you, you are a product of God's hands, right? You're his handiwork. And so when I say, hey, how's your relationship with the Lord? Well, I know I need to do this, and I know I need to do this, and I know I need to do this, and I should be better at that, and there's some stuff I need to be. That's all about you. You're carrying too much responsibility in this thing. Paul's ask God, God, what are you doing? I'm the work of his hands. Because if you're not careful, especially those of us who are churchgoers, Every Sunday, every time you hear a sermon and it's on prayer and you walk out and say, oh, I need to pray better. Or it's on Bible. Oh, I need to, I need to, I need to spend more time with the Lord. And, and it's on giving. Well, I need, to be a, I need to be more generous. It's on serving. Well, I need to... Before you know it, you've got like five, seven, 12 different things that you need to be better at. How exhausting is that going to be for you? There is no way in the world you can do all of that. So what I would say is, go to the Lord, little simple prayer, Father, what do you, what do you want me to work on? What should I be paying attention to? What are you working in me right now? What are you working in me that I need to be working out? Uh, what are you doing in my life? Like, Lord, what are you up to in my life? And sort of like reverse this thing to where, the, to where yes, it might, be, it might be all kinds of service, but the responsibility for the transformation that's taking place in your life, the Lord says, I, I am going to place the Holy Spirit within you like a down payment. So to prove to you that I've got you, you're mine. I'm going to work on you. And I just want you to work out what I'm working within. So this idea, serving God, maybe it, it, it's... It, so when we're talking about resting in the Spirit, I, I think uh, rest is vitally important. Like physical rest is vitally important. Make room for it. Have that Sabbath and all of that. That's not exactly this. This is... This is I want you to think of like rest as uh, equal on par to praying, like praying is really important for the Christian life, right? S scripture, scripture is very important to the Christian life. Uh, church community, having folks around you, praying with you, praying for you, doing life together, vitally important. Equal to those things is also rest. Like who am I relying on? to accomplish what I want to see taking place in my life. Am I driving or is the Lord driving? Who's, who's at work here? Uh, I'm responsible for my own input. God is responsible for the outcome. I'm responsible for my input. I plant, I water. Who gives the increase? It's the Lord that gives the increase. And so if I take on the responsibility of the increase, if I take the responsibility of the, what, what's transpired here, no, I'm responsible for my input. I'm, the, the Lord's got some stuff for me to do and to be. But that outcome, that outgrowth, that's in the hands of the Lord. God is serious about you resting and relying on him. In fact, from what we'll read in Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, he uses this group of people, and you know them well. They were the group that came out of Egypt, came right up to the brink of the promised land, and would not go in for fear of the giants and fear of, and fear of what was taking place there. And God got so upset with them. At first, he said, I'm just going to destroy the whole lot. And Moses said, please don't do that. And then he said, okay, I'm just... They're just going to die out here in the wilderness. We're going to, we're, this whole generation, 20 and up, they're just all going to die off. And when Moses went back and told them, like, God said, we're just, going to, we're just going to wither away out here in the wilderness until this older generation dies off because you wouldn't trust God and you wouldn't believe God when he told you this land is yours. 
And then they said, okay, tell God we're sorry and we're going to go in anyway. And then Moses said, no, you can't do it now. The fact is they tried it and many of them were destroyed. You know why? Because then what they were saying is, we're going to prove to God how sorry we are. We're going to prove to God that it's like you're still in the wrong frame of mind. Who is fighting your battles? Who are you relying on to accomplish what you want to see in your own life and accomplish what you want to see in your ministry? It's either God is at work, and when God is at work, you can be at rest. You know why you can be at rest? Because God's at work. And man, all of a sudden, ministry can become a joy. It's a joy. It's like, what is? look at what God is doing. God's working in this person's life and in that person's life, and that's awesome. That's not on me. I, don't have, I can't produce that. Only God can produce that. The desire that I want to see in your heart, like in my heart, to, to be all that I can be for the Lord, I cannot produce that. No sermon will produce that. No thought from me is going to produce that. Only the Holy Spirit at work. Do I have a part to play? Yes. You got a part to play? Absolutely. But you have an input to put in. But the outcome, the result, the fruit, the growth, the increase, that's on the Lord. And once you, like, once you find that space, man, it's, a, it's just a relief in my own life. And so uh, today and, and, and next Sunday, think in, in terms in two ways, resting in the spirit for your own salvation. That's what we'll talk about for just a little bit today. Like that's the foundation. And that, because that's going to give you a good frame of reference for the rest of your Christian life. Because chances are most of us in this room and, and those of us online, chances are you're not working. You don't feel like you're working for your own salvation. You don't feel like you're working to get saved. Most of us understand that that is by grace alone. So that's the frame of mind. That's the framework that you have to take into every other step of the Christian life. You didn't work to get saved. You don't work to stay saved. And just like that, you're not going to work for anything else in this Christian life. It's what God is doing through you. And when God is at work, you can be at rest. You may be exhausted but you can be at emotional rest because God is at work. So he, in Hebrews chapter 4, he references this crowd of people over and over and over. They came, to the, they came up to the brink of the promised land, and they wouldn't go in. And so let me give you a little bit of a, a rundown, and then we'll read this next verse in a minute. But I'm going to run you like all the way through Exodus, and, and Leviticus is all laws, uh, and then numbers, because what I want you to see is how many times God came through for these people over and over and over and over again. And then they get up to the promised land and we're like, I don't think God, I don't think we can do this. It's like <laughs> the plagues, you walked out of Egypt, Pharaoh released you. He walked you through the Red Sea. He drowned Pharaoh's army. On and on and on and on and on. And now you come up to the brink and now God can't. I can't rely on the Lord to do what God has told us to do. No wonder the Lord said, we just got to let this crowd die off. How pitiful, how sad that is. So Exodus 1, we end up with Genesis. Joseph now has, uh, is in Egypt. He's second in command. Exodus 1, there's 70 people that make up the nation of Israel. They go into Egypt. The, uh, crowd, the, the crowd says, or the scripture says, it's about 70, and they're under Joseph's care. By the time you get to Exodus 12, you have, it's 430 years has passed. They have forgotten, the scripture says they had another Pharaoh, and actually more Pharaohs, but they had forgotten Joseph. The people of Egypt, the Egyptians had gotten uh, scared of, or they became, they felt vulnerable to the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel had been blessed so much within them, they actually enslaved them. And for 430 years, they lived in slavery. It's probably about a million of them. So you go from 70 to over somewhere over a million folks in that 430 years. They get released. You know the story, the 10 plagues. Uh, the Jews leave after the 10 plagues that Moses uh, brings them out. Exodus 14, they cross the Red Sea, 
Exodus 16, God feeds them with manna. 17, he brings water from a rock. Exodus 20, he gives them the commandments. Exodus 25, he, he creates this Ark of the Covenant. His very presence is going to be with them. Exodus 26, he announces the tabernacle like, hey, here's how you're going to have a relationship with me. Uh, by Exodus, uh, Exodus, uh, Exodus 40, uh, the tabernacle is built. Uh, after, after the tabernacle was announced in, in, in 26, and so that works you through the book of Exodus. By the time you get to Leviticus, Leviticus is just like all laws. The Lord is saying, hey, I'm, I'm walking you into this promised land. This is the, this is the land I've, I gave to your forefathers. And you're, when you go in, we're already going to be set up. Here's my presence. Here's how you're going to relate with me. Here's this law and this law and this law. Leviticus are just full of laws. Here's how you treat people. Here's how you treat people that harm you. Here's how you treat the stranger. Here's how you plant your crops. I mean, everything. He's laying it all out, right? Because why? Because we're going to go into the promised land. You've spent 430 years in slavery. You've not been your own people. You've not been able to choose how you want to live each day. And now all of a sudden you've got all of this freedom. And I'm going to show you this is how we're going to relate uh, with each other. That's all of Leviticus. Numbers, when numbers get started, it's basically the scripture or the book is called Numbers. It was just a census. We were numbering everybody. How many folks we got to take care of? So it's an organizational kind of a book, right? They're getting ready. Numbers chapter 11, because they complained about the manna, the Lord said, okay, I'll give you some quail, right? Over and over and over again, God answers, God protects, God provides, God shows them. By Numbers 13, which would have been about a year and a half after they came out of Egypt, right? So Exodus, um, what was it? Exodus 14, they crossed the Red Sea. Numbers 13, Numbers 14, this is like a, just only a year and a half's time. They've been working their way up to the boundary of the promised land. We got all the laws situated. We got the priesthood figured out. This is how we're going to relate to each other. Here's the tabernacle. Here's the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Here's my presence. And here's how I want you to relate to each other and with me. Like we got all this thing figured out. Then in Exodus 13, they come to the, they, they come to the boundary of the promised land. The Lord says, in Exodus, or in, I'm sorry, in Numbers 13, the Lord says, send 12 spies one from each tribe, and I want you to go in to determine how to bring the victory, right? Not if. I want you to go in and you determine your strategy of like, hey, this is how we're going to do it. You know what took place. Uh, Numbers 14, they come back, 10 saw bad and two saw good, right? Uh, 10 came back and said, we're like grasshoppers in front of these folks. There's no way in the world we can do this. We cannot go in and turn the opinion of all the people. They all begin to murmur and complain and rebel. And rebel. Numbers 14. Uh, here's the text in verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will you despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? No wonder he gets put out with them. It's like, it's like been a, a year and a half of miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And now we bring you up to the edge of the promised land. You go in and you see these giants, granite like giants, but did you not cross a red, did I not part a, an ocean for you? Did you not walk over dry ground? Get to the other side, get up on the, up on the edge or up on the cliff, turn around and watch me drown Pharaoh's army. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, but no, we can't, we can't over and over and over again. Chapter 14, verses 22 and 23 says this, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these 10 times. 
It's not talking about the plagues. That's talking about all the things they complained about that the Lord answered for them while they have, over the last year and a half, none of these men who have seen my glory, my signs that I did in Egypt and the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice. None of them shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despised me shall see it. The Lord took offense. I've done so much for you, and, and you still think that you're responsible. You still think, well, I've got to, and it's in my hands, and we're going to go. And yeah, I know the Lord said that this, this land was ours, but Maybe God hasn't seen these giants. Maybe God, maybe this is too much for him. Are you kidding me? And so this is why the Lord says, you know what? When the Lord comes to a place to where it's like, I don't know that I can get you to, I don't know that I can get you to see anything different. And I am not going to let this rebellion and this unbelief, that was the thing he mentions over and over in Hebrews, this unbelief. Uh, we are not going to go into this new land that I have promised to you. So what does he do? They live in a wilderness. They were right up to the edge of the promised land. Don't think of the promised land as salvation. Think of the promised land as the spirit-filled life. This is the life that I want you to experience. Is there battles there? Yes, yes. But I got you. I've led you here, and I'm not going to leave you now. I saved you from the start. I'll save you in the middle and save you in the end. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 then. Now that you got that backstory of those that uh, said no, let me read. Uh, I've got the uh, text verse up here for Hebrews, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, read much of the verse. It actually starts in, if you have a Bible or a device, it actually this theme actually starts in, in chapter 3, uh, in verse uh, 11, which he's, he's actually quoting Psalm 95, but he just says here, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 12, take care, brothers, lest th there be in any, uh, any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold the original confidence firm to the end as it is said. Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts in the, in the rebellion. What was the rebellion? The rebellion was, this must be in my hands, and God, not in yours. The rebellion is, I know you've come through over and over and over again. I'm just not sure you'll come through this time. The rebellion was, yes, I know you've answered over and over and over, but somehow this next challenge, this next mountain must be my responsibility. The Lord's like, how many times do I have to come through for you, for you to walk up to this next mountain and have confidence that the Lord can move it if need be, or he'll give me strength to climb it. Verse um, 16, um, for, I'm actually in chapter 3. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who, here's this crowd, was it not all those who left Egypt uh, led by Moses and with whom was provoked for 40 years? They spent one year for every day they spied out the land of Canaan. It took them 40 days to figure out they couldn't conquer Canaan. And the Lord said, you're going to spend one year for every day you spent there because I sent you there not to figure out if you could do it. I sent you there to come up with a strategy of how you wanted to do it. So there was going to be a fight. There was going to be a battle. But I was going to see you through it. I've, I've seen you through it all along, have I not? Was it not with those who sinned, uh, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he, we swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter, enter what? Enter that rest because of unbelief. Now I'm in chapter four. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. 
What is this rest? This rest is this spirit-filled life to where I am resting in the spirit to do the work that only the spirit can do in me and through me. Whatever it is that God has called me to do, he is going to empower me to do it. Whatever challenge there is for you to reach, whatever sin there is for you to get freedom in, Dear friend, that's not on you. That's on the Lord through you. God wants to work through you. God wants to show you his strength through you. When you take like the wheel, when you take the reins and I'm, oh, I'm going to do this. The Lord's like, you didn't do it to start with. You've never done it before until this time. I had to come and rescue you. I had to come all the way to you. Wrap, wrote, uh, wrap myself in flesh, dwell among you, be tempted in all points so I could save you. And so at what point are you like coming up with this idea that now it's, now it's you? This is what Paul writes to the folks at Galatia. You started out in the spirit, trusting the spirit to do his work. Now somewhere along the line, it's like, oh, but now it's in my hands. The Lord doesn't take kindly to when you take the, the responsibility that is not. You have some responsibility of input, but the outcome, the result, the fruit, the harvest, that's the Lord's. Verse 2 of chapter 4, for good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard, it did not benefit them. This is, this is supposed to be good news. It's good news that you are the work of God's hands, not the other way around. But it did not benefit them because they were not united by faith and those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said. And now he quotes again, as I sworn my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's got a rest for all of us. I keep reading, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of in the seventh day in this way, and God rested. He's given you a frame of reference here. God rested on the seventh day from all of his works, and again, uh, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest, like that kind of rest. Verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, Enter what? Enter that rest. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. <laughs> I think this was a sermon. Some say that Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't particularly, it doesn't matter. But I think it was originally a sermon that was probably preached and then put down uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm thinking that this is actually a message being preached. But, but he is, what he's doing, he is absolutely just like driving this home. This is, a, this is one of those parents who you want to say as a child, but you dare not say, I heard you, right? And that parent just like, on and on and on and on. And the reason the parent says it 50 different times is, no, I don't think you did because you keep doing the same stupid thing, right? And so you just keep saying, on. And, and this is what you get this writer or this preacher uh, here in Hebrews, like he just, I want you to get a hold of this. The responsibility for your growth, the responsibility for your transformation, you, it ain't on you. You are the work of God's hands. Rest in that, that God is at rest. When God is at work, I can be at rest. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then... Here we go again. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now, here's the key verse in, uh, in verse 11. Let us, look at the wording in verse 11. Let us therefore strive. You could say work. You could say like 
Let us spend our energy and our effort. Let us strive to enter that rest. You got to work at resting. This is like when you go on vacation, right? It takes like two or three days to get adjusted. You go and your mind just still keeps running. Did I do this? Did we turn the stove off? Did, you know, it's like, relax. And, and, you know, if the vacation's too short, by the time, like, you actually rest, it's like, well, we got to go. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. You got to strive at resting. You got to strive at letting God do what only God can do. The transformation, the growth, the work in your life that you want to see take place. You are the work of his hands. And when God is at work, you can be at rest. But if you can't, like, let go of that and, like, well, surely there's something. Yes, there is. You have input. You have a responsibility, but not of outcome. You have the responsibility of input. I know I need to do, I need to input this. I'm going to plant I'm going to water. Who gives the increase? God shows the increase. And when I know that God gives the increase, you go out. This is planting time. Maybe, maybe a little late now. I don't know. But you go out, right? You plant it. You water it. Do you go back in the next day and say, oh, I got to get up early in the morning. I got to start pulling those little things up out of the... Pl-. No, you can be at rest. I've done my part. I planted. I watered. I had input. Who causes, the, who causes the little sprout to sprout? That's God. That's God at work. Now it becomes like the joy of like, oh, look at this. Look what's taking place. I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on God. It's God, it's at, God is at work here. And when God is at work, I can be at rest. I don't carry this on me all the time to where I'm, it's like it's always on me. Man, if you're not careful, you will take like all of that and just always feel like there's, I uh, just know there's always got to be something more that I need to be doing, saying, going. Yeah, is there input that you could put into your life? Yes, yes, of course, yes. But it's like, Who are you relying on, counting on, trusting on to bring that growth about? This is why he says, we must let us therefore strive to enter into that restful state that the Spirit of God is at work. And when the Spirit of God is at work, I can be of rest. Let me jump down to verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed from, uh, passed from the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are. He's gone, he knows what you're going through, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, like that's a restful state, with confidence, Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Dear friend, God is at work. So, just as when you came to Christ and whoever presented the gospel to you in sermon or at the altar worker or wherever it was, if you got saved, you heard something similar to you can't save yourself. You can't help yourself get saved. The service that you do is not because you're trying to earn your way to heaven, right? The service that you do is because you are saved. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference. There's an eternal difference that says, I'm not not going to church to get saved. I attend church because I am saved. I'm not giving to get saved. I'm giving because I am saved. I'm not praying to get saved. I'm not... I'm not reading my Bible in order trying to earn my way to heaven. I read my Bible, I pray, I serve, I give, I go because I am saved. Who did the saving? God did the saving. He saved you. He did that work. And right now, you are not 
I, I am at total and complete rest for my soul's salvation. I don't worry. I don't think, well, have I done enough? Have I gone enough? Am I good enough? Have I cut out enough bad? Am I, am I putting in enough good? And enough, enough good for what? Cutting out enough bad for what? To be saved? No. We know that, right? And so we've got a good frame of reference when it comes to resting in God's hands for my soul salvation. Now, if you could take that frame of mind for rest and apply it to every other step of your Christian life, you'll discover this restful state that when God's at work, I can be at rest. Let me show you that frame of reference. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. The verse that uh, changed my life. Um, several years ago, when I was able to, in the words of the great theologian Carrie Underwood, take my hands off the wheel and give it to Jesus because he is at work. Here it is. Therefore, here's your frame of reference. As you have, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, he's talking about the day you got saved. Remember the day you got saved? Did you work for that? Did you earn that? Did you give? Did you go? Did you say, I'm going to stop some stuff? I'm going to start some stuff. I'm going to be a better person. I ain't going to cuss as much, at least until I get really super mad or whatever it was. No, you came to Jesus and said, I cannot save myself. I cannot even help myself get saved. Lord, I come to you and I throw my, my soul's determination upon the mercy and grace of God and I accept your gift of salvation right? That's what you did. As you receive Jesus Christ the Lord, whatever, whatever ingredients were involved when you came to Jesus and that trust and that resting in him to do what only he can do, as you have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk in him. That says that first step, when you got saved, that first step of salvation where I stepped out on trusting him to do his work. Paul here says, now, you know, every other step is just like that first one. Every other step. What difference, it is, what difference do you want to see in your life? What areas do you need to grow in? What areas do you need, uh, do you need breakthrough in? What areas do you, do you need deliverance in? Oh, I need to do this, and I need to see this, and I want to see this, and I want to be better at this. Well, wonderful. Who are you trusting in to get you there? You, your efforts, your abilities, I'm telling you, you're going to get lost in the wilderness. And it's going to seem like you're so close, and yet you're going to be so far. And the difference is you're resting in the wrong person. You, don't rest in you. Rest in the Spirit of God. As you have for received Jesus, so walk in Him. Every other step of the Christian life, it's just like the very first one. And the first one was all Jesus. And every other step is going to be all Jesus. He's got input for you. He wants, to, he wants to walk with you. He wants to be yoked up with you. But you know this. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Jesus was, um, if Jesus was your mentor your discipler, like he's supposed to be anyway, right? But can you imagine? Can you imagine Jesus saying, uh, hey, let's go over here and witness to this guy. You and Jesus go to go over here and witness this guy. And between here and there, to over there to witness between the, to that guy, you said to Jesus, I'll take it. I got this. No, no you, we would not, would we? We would say, I'll just be quiet. That's probably pretty good. Because if Jesus is with you, you can just be quiet. What would, how would you conjure up in your mind? Oh, I want to see this. I want to see this growth in my life. I want to see this uh, development in my life. Lord, I think I got this part. Why would you do that? You have his strength to rely on or your strength to rely on. Should you spend three seconds determining whose strength you want to rely on? No. 
Jesus, he's got this. He's got you. Every step of the Christian faith. And dear friend, if you can just like take that thought, take that mindset, take that frame of mind and place it into your life. Every other step. So next Sunday we'll talk about like the actual service. But I want to make sure we're all on the same page when it comes to salvation. Knowing what are you, who are you trusting in? When you say to me, like, Pastor, I, I'm pretty sure that I'd be going to heaven if I died right now. And then I would say, hey, why would you think that? Well, I've stopped a whole lot of stuff, and I've started a whole lot of stuff, and I go to church now, and I, like, no, we need to have a conversation, right? Because it needs to be all Jesus. You got nothing to do with this. It's a free gift given. Your part was to say, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. I'll have that. Every other step of your Christian faith is going to be the same thing. The Lord says, I got a gift for you. Yeah, I'll step into that. I want to call you. I've got a calling for you to step into. Yes, I'll take that. Does all of a sudden now it becomes like now we're counting on you to... No, it's like, I am with you. I'm going to work through you. You are going to see his fingerprints all over your life. And this is what you want. Because my fingerprints, man, they just get... It just, everything gets, just gets messy. Just let the Lord do what the Lord wants to do. Rely on his strength. I pray my heart's desire is for you to have that confidence beyond anything that you are confident in this world about. The thing that you should be rock solid on is that heaven is my home, my sins are forgiven, and Christ is mine. And I know right now, God forbid, something were to happen to me, and you have, and I hope you cry a little bit about it, but you hear that I, I'm, I'm gone, you know, you'll know exactly where I'm at. And you won't have to say, well, he was a good guy, and he tried hard. No, no, you could say, Jesus was a Savior. That's it. That's all. That's all, right? So we know that for salvation. Do we have that same confidence that God is at work in my life to produce what I want to see myself in on this side of eternity? That same amount of confidence. Or to somehow, some way, I got a bigger part to play. No, it's the work of the Spirit. Rest. In the Spirit, of the, in the Holy Spirit, as He's working on us. Let me pray for us. Stand with me, please, if you would. Father, I pray that you'd help us. First and foremost, Lord, for the folks in the room and those listening to me online, if there would be any, Lord, who in their minds would have any confusion about this matter of salvation, and that heaven being their home, and their names being written in the Lamb's book of life, and for them to have a thousand percent confidence that heaven is theirs because of Jesus, and not because of them and what they've done or what they've stopped doing or what they're trying to do better at. I pray, Lord, that, that, that A, that they would have that confidence, and if not, like, Lord, even right now in this moment, that they would turn their backs on their own works and in trusting in themselves and they would turn solely and completely upon you and call upon you as their dear Lord and Savior for their own soul salvation and receive the gift that you offer all of humankind. And then, Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, who have made that, accept, who have accepted your gift, Lord, may we discover this promised land where there is battles to be fought, vineyards to be planted, Lord, houses to be built as the children of Israel would have moved in and as they did move into the promised land. Lord, uh, there was work to be done. 
But Lord, we were looking to you and trusting in you and our confidence was in you to bring about what you've promised to bring about in our lives. Lord, we're counting on you. And when you're at work, we can be at rest. I pray, Father, you'd help us to discover that. And as the writer of Hebrews says, to strive to enter into that kind of a rest. Bless, I pray, your word to our hearts and to our life. And we'll look forward, Lord, to being in your presence again uh, this next Lord's Day. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you folks, and you're dismissed.